All right, guys. Hello. I hope you had a good um, vacation. All right. What have we covered last time? We have been talking about infinite series. And I see that still quite a few of you have not arrived in this class. I possibly should show you what happens to students that do not come to class. Maybe that's one of the uh, things we will examine today. So first, let's consider this question, guys. So you have to tell me what is the number 0 0.444 onwards. Tell me what this number equals to, please. Go calculate it. See here again, guys. Turn on your video cameras so I may look at you. Okay, some people solved it. Seems interesting. And if you did solve it, guys, um, let's let's see. Let's see if we are right. So what we do is uh, we first recognize that this number, we call it something. So the something equals to four over 10 plus four over 10 squared. Uh, plus four over 10 cubed and onwards. Yes? So then we place parentheses around everything that, uh, except for the first term. Do you see why we do that? It's because what's in the red parentheses can be seen as the entire sum once I factor something. Now, what do I factor? I clearly would like to factor uh, one over 10. So it's four over 10 plus one over 10. Exactly, right? And then uh, whatever follows in the summation, I hope I can skip that extra step. Once I factor one over 10, what's inside the red parentheses looks exactly like the original sum. Do you agree? And if it looks exactly like the original sum, I can just simply write it as S. So now I simplified my equation. So the sum equals to four over 10 plus one over 10 times the sum. And so moving it across uh, the equal sign, I have that nine tenths of the sum equals to four tenths which means that the sum equal to four divided by nine as, let's see how many people uh, answered it right. 
Well, a number, right? So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I think eight people, guys, but th not everyone. Let's try another question there. Do you understood? How, do you understand how we did it, guys? Just very similar question, just one more time, and you answer it as fast as you possibly can. Now, what? Tell me, please, is the number zero point? Um, Seven, 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 seven. What do you think is the number? Yeah, so seven repeated. I'm sure you can uh, do it very fast, but uh, see if you can also um, see the technique. Okay, great. You see that the answer is seven over nine. Now, why is it seven over nine? For the very simple reason that if this number is equal to something, guys, as we mentioned in the very previous lecture, this number is 7 over 10. That's what this thing is. 7 over 10, 7 over 10 squared plus onwards, right? So, yes. Right, you see that, guys? Uh, plus 7 over 10 cubed and onwards. So what I can do is, again, because I realized that the sum contains itself, I put parentheses after the first term. Yes? And here I factor 1 over 10. Do you see why I factor 1 over 10? It's not, it's not a prescription. It's just that if I factor 1 over 10, what remains in the parentheses is the, the original sum. That's, that's my uh, realization. Factor 1 over 10. And you get seven over 10 times one over 10. So plus one over 10. And what remains in the parentheses is S. You all see that? Just if you factor one over 10, it will be now seven over 10, seven over 10 squared and onwards. So that would be that. So move it around and you have nine over 10 S equals to seven over 10 from which S equals to seven divided by nine as many of you have answered correctly. Good. Now one more. Let's do one more. And this time I want you to tell me what is uh, 0 0.242424. So the 24 is repeated. What is that now? Okay, Anna, very nice. Very good. Okay. And the answer is very obvious, correct guys? So all we have to do is uh, set it equal to S. This time, uh, this S equals to 24. That's the convenient way to represent it. 24 over 100 plus 24 over 100 squared plus 24 over 100 cubed forever so. Put parentheses around the next term, factor out 1 over 100. Good, factor out 1 over 100, so what do we get? Twenty four over 100 plus 1 over 100. And look what happens in the parentheses if I factor it. It's 24 over 100 plus 24 over 100 squared and onwards. Now, because this is an infinite sum, this is an infinite sum, I see that what's in the red parentheses is nothing more than, nothing more than S. Uh, thank you, Jahin, right? Nothing more than S itself. So we have that this is 24 over 100 plus one over 100 S, look at it, S equals to this expression here, from which 
after very basic algebra, just move S minus one over hundred S. One second, guys, I'll release uh, my prisoner. And what happens now? What remains is, well, what remains is simply 99 over 100 S equal to 24 over 100. So S equals to 24 over 99. You, it doesn't matter if you can simplify it further. The point is that I have a fraction, clearly a fraction. Yeah. Now, let's go back to the current lecture. So we figured out to solve a few of such things. Here, is, uh, here are some examples of that. And we began speaking about infinity and the possible problems uh, in dealing with infinity or growth without bound. We ended with this observation, guys, that uh, and that's a, a central observation in uh, in physics and relates to the multiplication by zero. So remember that if we have uh, two astronauts that are in space pulling a rope of mass zero, right? The rope of mass zero, those two astronauts are not able to pull the rope with different forces. Ah, right, Christian, I forgot to mention uh, the monk. You are correct. I should go back to the problem of the monk and thank you for reminding me about it, right? I'll finish this description and we will quickly go and discuss uh, the monk. Thank you for reminding me. So uh, here with the rope, guys, they pull the rope on both directions and uh, the, the difference in forces is mass times acceleration, but since mass is zero, the difference of those forces must be zero. So the forces cannot be different. You use that idea uh, all the time in physics. And, and the only way that the, the forces could be, uh, could be different is if acceleration were infinite, but we do not allow infinite acceleration in mechanics. Good. So uh, if you study physics and you, and you wonder why the tension in the cord is uniform, that has to do with those ideas. The tension in the cord is generally, if the cord uh, gains mass, will not be uniform. But uh, in ideal physics, when you begin, you consider the situation where uh, the tension is uniform. All right, let's quickly return to what I forgot to discuss. Uh, I gave you this assignment, guys. Uh, I wonder how many of you bothered to think about. Did you think about the monk? Right? Did you think about the monk and whether or not uh, you can prove that uh, on both parts of the video, the monk is in the same position at the same time? Let me remind you of the problem. Here is that problem, guys. What's happening, guys? Uh, internet connection not good? Yes, one second. Seems okay, right? At least uh, based on uh, the speed test. I do not know what's uh, happening. Maybe I should connect through wire, but we'll try to brave through it. Can you hear me?
Am I coming through okay? Yes, Professor, we can hear you. Good, thank you. So here is the Tibetan monk problem. It, we might have interruptions today. I mean, uh, I will see what I can, I mean, today, uh, maybe for the next lecture, I can do something about it. I will probably not uh, meddle with uh, the uh, link just now. So here is the question, guys. Tibetan monk leaves the monastery at 7 a.m. and takes his usual path to the top of the mountain, arriving at 7 p.m. The following morning, he does the same uh, pathway, the same route, but he starts at the top of the mountain uh, at 7 a.m. and reaching um, the bottom at 7 p.m. Here is the animations. Can you picture them, guys? First and second day. So uh, in the, in the, if you play the videos uh, synchronously, side by side, you will see that this monk eventually ends up on the top of the mountain, and this monk here, in the second video ends at the bottom of the mountain. There is no um, knowledge of how they move. And any ideas, uh, why would you, might you imagine that there is at least one moment of time where in both videos, the monks is in the same place at the same time. So there is a, a time bar, a time placement where the monk is on the same elevation of the mountain. Uh, so, Professor, how I understood is like I took two functions mm -hmm. uh, based on the position of the monk on mm -hmm. day one and day two. Mm -hmm. And then I also calculated the time and the location of the monk. Uh, of the monk sorry. So, we have one time which is 7 a.m. and another one is 7 p.m. And then for the location, we have the base of the mountain and then the top of the mountain that he reaches. Mm -hmm. So I, um, what I did was to, um, like, to show why these two functions are equal. For example, I got f of t for time and h of t. Mm -hmm. So you used uh, um, you used what? You used the difference of those functions. Yeah, we should use the difference so we can calculate if these two functions are equal. That's good. So you're thinking very well. Let me just, before you're saying that, guys, why is this obvious? Bef without too much mathematics, how would you convince somebody that uh, it's obviously true that there is one moment of time where the people in both videos are on the same spot on the mountain? What do you do? Well, I, I, I think that uh, except for Christiana, not many of you remember to think about this problem. He's taking the same path. Uh, we can assume that the same amount of time elapsed nat naturally. But uh, so what, how, what do you do guys? Here are the two videos. What do you do with them? Well, when you say it's continuous function, what is it's? You have to remember, guys, that uh, it is a vague word. Yeah, but you're doing it uh, mechanically, right? So you're using some procedure to be convinced, but why would you think it's true, guys? Look at it. What you can do is you can place one video on top of another and make them transparent. Do you see what happens if you place one video on top of another? You will see that uh, you will see both monks, the monk on the bottom and the monk on the top of the mountain, right? Two copies of them. They have to, in the, in the amount of time from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m., they will have to switch places, which means they have to meet. You understand? If I were to place one video on top of another, they will have to meet because how do you get uh, one monk descending on the path and one monk going up? If they follow the same pathway, they meet at some, uh, at some moment of time. Do you agree? That's uh, how you can be intuitively convinced that uh, that will happen. And now, how do you prove that this happens? Well, in the middle, uh, Humira, that's not clear exactly when they will meet. It could be that, uh, uh, that 
that one monk uh, is running up the mountain and arrives uh, at 5 p.m. on the top of the mountain and the other one hasn't started walking yet, right? So they will meet uh, somewhere in some duration, in the middle of, uh, of what exactly? Not necessarily in the middle of the mountain, but they have to switch places. Uh, through the amount of time when they are walking, they will have to switch places, which means that they will have to cross each other's, uh, they will have to meet each other at least once. Here is uh, the solution suggested uh, by Christiana, and that's um, how we prove it, okay? So mathematically, we can say that, well, there is going to be a position of uh, the monk as a time function on day one, and there is going to be another function at uh, day two. So those are the functions f and g, clear? I will normalize uh, to be at, uh, for the for the beginning of the video to be at zero and the end of the video to be at one. It's just more convenient for me. I don't like 7 a.m., 7 p.m. I say zero represents uh, beginning of the video, right? I just rescale time. Zero is the beginning of the video. One is the end of this video. And I will normalize the elevation of the mountain also to be zero and one. So zero is base of mountain. One is top of mountain. Good. And then uh, what I'm trying to prove is that uh, f of t equals to g of t. So before I continue, everyone is clear on what is f and what is g. Are you clear, guys? It should be, it should be uh, your functional idea. So for example, what is f of zero? If it's clear, tell me what is f of zero based on my notation. f of zero equals to what? That's the only value I know for sure. f of zero equals to? Well, zero equals to 7 a.m., but f of zero based on my relabelings. You understand? I labeled zero to be the base of the mountain, one to be the top of the mountain. I basically change my scale, right? And uh, change the scale of time to be between zero and one. You don't have to do that, but it's just convenient. I, I don't like 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. Okay, so in my notation, f of zero is what? The starting point, which means give me the, the number. f of zero equals to what number? When t is equal to zero, what is f of zero? Yes. What's f of zero? Uh, well, Fazia, uh, the monk on day one at 7 a.m., that's the location, yes, that's the location. But what is that according to my notation, Robert? God damn it. Am I coming through? So the answer is zero. F of zero is zero. Zero is the code for base of the mountain. Good. So F of zero is zero. What is G of zero, if you understand me? G of zero is what now? Humira one, exactly, finally, right? G of zero is one because that's G of zero is where the monk on day two at in the beginning of the video, which is one, which means top of the mountain. I just uh, rephrased that, okay? Now, it's not a magical monk. The monk does not teleport, yes? Which means if I gradually change time, the position of the monk gradually changes, which means that uh, the functions are continuous. Do you agree? If I believe that uh, a small amount of time will, will create a gradual change, that means that the function is continuous, right? And uh, so I solve the equation f of t equal to g of t. This, uh, and I want to prove that the solution must exist. So I create a function k of t, which is f of t minus g of t. Okay, f of t minus g of t, I compare, uh, because to say, to solve this equation is the same as to solve f minus g equal to zero. So I do that, you understand? I like to compare against zero. And then let's see if we have a solution. So k of t, is a difference of two continuous functions, it must be continuous. Yes? Now let's check what is k of zero. k of zero is zero minus one, which is minus one, which is less than zero. And k of one is one minus zero, which is one, which is bigger than zero. Agreed? So the k function crosses the x-axis. Between it's, it's between minus one and one. There, is, there must be therefore a solution uh, some number t0 at which k of t0 is equal to zero. 
But at that moment, g of uh, t0 and f of t0 are the same. That's the moment guaranteed by the intermediate value theorem. Uh, that they, they do, there, there might be many moments like that, maybe infinitely many moments like that. But there is at least one moment when uh, both monks uh, from video one and video two cross each other's paths, which would be kind of intuitive if you superimpose and make transparent both videos. You understand? So now you have two monks, one at the base of the mountain, one at the top, and you make it one video. You understand what I mean? You've seen that uh, done in many movies, right? You've seen a movie where, let's say, I, I can make a movie where I'm talking to myself. You agree? By uh, interlacing two videos. I mean, I sit on one edge of the couch and uh, another video where I was sitting at the other edge of the couch and you merge it into one video. That's what I'm pretty much saying here. Clear? Wonderful. Now let's get back to uh, the previous lecture. Let's see how much we can uh, go through it. So limits at infinity. Here is a, a, a question from probability. Let's see if we can uh, figure it out. I'm not expecting that, but I hope you might figure it out. So guys, imagine this not so very interesting game where what you do is you roll a fair die until either the number one appears and then you stop or the number six appears and then you stop. You understand? So you, you, the, stopping, uh, uh, the stopping of this game is either at one or at two. The first time, the first one of those numbers appearing will stop the game. You win if uh, you stop at six and you lose if you stop at one. Now, what's the probability that you win? Uh, we did it in this class, yes? So the probability happened to be, Christina, happens to be one half. Good, you see why it happens to be one half? I mean, we can uh, form, in fact, this, this procedure can be answered by considering an infinite sum, right? An infinite sum of this form. And uh, once you add things together, uh, you get that uh, the probability is one half, which you could have, of course, understood by symmetry because the, the die does not care if it should end at one or at six. You understand? It doesn't matter that there are steps in between. There is no preference in this process to uh, end at, at one or six. As they say in German, the Avofer is gleichkultig. The uh, die is indifferent. Here is um, a very famous question, guys. Are you ready for it? And uh, this question puzzled uh, many people, very smart ones as well, especially it was popular in the 1950s. And it's famed to have been asked of John von Neumann, who was one of the three Martians. That's what they called him. He was so brilliant and so fast thinking that they thought of him, uh, thought of him as uh, a person from another planet. Okay, so here is that question, guys. And uh, I'll tell you how von Neumann solved it. And I will, I, I mean, I will give you, uh, I probably will not talk too long about how von Neumann solved it. He solved it very fast. Uh, I solved it initially the same way, probably much slower than von Neumann and not exactly in my head. But uh, there is a very, very simple solution to it. Okay. So here is that question, guys. Two cyclists start 20 miles apart. They ride towards each other at uh, 10 miles per hour. You understand? A fly sitting on the nose of one person immediately takes off and flies to the nose of the other person at 15 miles an hour. And the fly will move back and forth from the nose of one person to the other until the cyclists meet. Imagine that those cyclists will meet touching noses. You understand? They will touch with their noses. Clear? The question is, um, the question is, how much distance will the fly have covered? Do you follow the question? Clear? Back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. The cyclists uh, are meeting. How much distance will the fly have covered until the noses um, touch? 
Think about it a few moments and see if you have an idea, then we'll solve it together. Okay, Humira, very interesting. Very interesting what you're saying. And let's see, uh, let's just wait for the other people to say something before I continue. So David says the fly will, will cover 30 miles. And so says Robert. Notice guys, uh, ask yourself how long will it take uh, for the cyclist to meet? Okay, Francis says 7.87 miles. All right, so some people said something. I hope it was based on some observations. Wait another minute or two and we'll talk about it. Artik of Sharuz, are you here? Okay, a bunch of you answered this question. That's nice. That's impressive, actually. I mean, uh, maybe you heard it before or maybe you are that clever. So here is uh, the simple way to uh, to figure it out guys the fly always moves from one nose to another back and forth but always at the same speed it doesn't have to accelerate or decelerate in some sense it's a very magical fly right it moves from one nose to another immediately rebouncing at the same speed in particular the fly travels all the time at 15 miles per hour do you agree it travels all the time at 15 miles per hour and it will travel the distance that it takes the bicycles to, it will travel, sorry, for the time it takes the bicycles to meet. Now, how long will it take the bicycles to meet? That's pretty easy here, right? So each of them moves at 10 miles an hour. They have to cover a distance of 20. So if you wait one hour, each of them covers uh, its part of 10 miles. So in one hour they meet. And everyone who said uh, 15 miles uh, is, the, is, is correct. You see that? The fly will be in the air for 15 uh, miles distance. It will travel 15 mile distance back and forth. Now, uh, before I move uh, through the solution, could you please tell me how many back and forth movements does the, the fly execute? 
how many back and forth movements? One, two, three, four, how many of those movements will the fly execute? What do you think? So Francis says two, well, not at least, I want you to tell me how many back and forth movements the fly executes. That's, uh, I mean, you, you answered it and said 15 miles an hour, sorry, 15 miles, but uh, you didn't tell me how many. Exactly two? How many of you say three? Anyone says three? We started 20 miles apart. Yes. How many times does the fly go back and forth? It's pretty interesting, guys. How many times back and forth? The fly moves. We will talk about those paradoxes of not moving shortly. Well, not shortly, maybe not today, but soon enough. Okay. Now, all of you are thinking it's finite and all of you are wrong. The fly will travel back and forth infinitely many times. Yes. You see, so that's interesting that you, uh, many of you said 15 miles, but it will be infinitely many times. Now here is, uh, I suppose, how? Here is the picture. Do you see? Here are the cyclists, here is the fly, moving back and forth, okay? So here is what I, uh, what I said, and, that's, and, and this will explain possibly, this is what I did, by the way, okay? I will just go through the argument. I do not think you will right away understand it because my argument was much more complicated than what we just uh, solved, right? And uh, so this was asked of von Neumann and I did pretty much the same. I just, uh, I just said the following guys, okay? Uh, I said the following. I said, let t, k, t sub k be the time for trip k uh, of the fly. You understand? So I do not know how many trips the fly executes, but let's suppose tk is how long it will take the fly, uh, you know, to, to do the next trip, right? To do the next uh, movement. Good. So how do I figure out uh, this uh, tk move? So tk move would be basically, obviously the fly, do you agree that the fly from the first person will reach uh, the nose of the other person before they have met? Do you agree? It, it travels faster. Do you agree with that? You see, guys, so it should be immediately obvious it should be infinite. Look at it. Look at the picture. The fly will reach the nose of the other person. Do you agree? Before they meet. Now imagine this video is paused and now the fly sits uh, at the nose of the other person. The distance between them has shrunk. But now the fly will take off and it has some distance to travel, right? And do you agree? This distance will not be closed. They are not traveling uh, as fast as uh, the fly, right? This distance will not be closed, so the fly will travel to the nose of the other person before uh, they meet, you agree? The fly will reach the other nose before the two cyclists meet. So they will get closer, but the fly is moving faster, so it will reach the other nose. So there is still distance uh, left. So you see already more than two trips. And for every trip, you see, you see the TK, the fly has, um, or, although a much shorter distance to travel, but it has a distance to travel, so it will execute infinitely many trips. Do you agree? Do you see that now, right? Because at each step, the fly is on the nose of a person and there is still distance to be traveled. So if after first step, after second step, after third step, so you can see that in any finitely number, not many number of steps, there is a tiny distance between the cyclists, but that distance will be traversed by the fly faster than this, 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 than this gap can be closed because the fly is traveling faster. Do you agree? So that necessitates that the number of trips of the fly will be infinite. Okay, so now I'm showing the equation. Are you with me? You see how I reason, right? So it's pretty interesting that you solved this question, many of you, but you did not notice the infinity here. So this is how I solved it, which is not the easy way to do it. That's for Neumann solution, right? Uh, and that there is a joke about it. For Neumann answered it in one second, and uh, and and they and they asked him, "Well, how do you you knew the trick?" And he's and he's thinking, "What about it? It's just infinite series." He just crunched it uh, very rapidly, like a machine. Okay, and this is so you appreciate what sort of crunching is happening here. Let me let me label the symbols this way. So T K is the duration of the cave trip, of which there are infinitely many. Yes. 
and dk minus one is the distance uh, of uh, that that remains for that um, uh, for that trip. Okay, so tk is the uh, is the trip, and uh, and dk minus one is the distance that I will see just as I uh, embark on the journey. And this is going to be the situation: the distance that remained after the previous trip is equal to the sum of the speeds multiplied by the the speeds of this of one cyclist and the speed of the fly multiplied by the duration of the flight okay which uh, uh, which then creates a recursive formula when i solve for it look at it when i solve for it i know this formula i hope you understand it right when will they meet uh, during the flight the cyclist directly opposite the fly will close and the fly will close, right? So they will cover the distance uh, remaining. Always cover the distance that, uh, that, that uh, before the trip has begun. So for example, when I begin the trip, the distance is 20 miles. The fly goes out and the cyclists go out. The, the sum of the distances traveled by the cyclist and the fly equals to 20 miles. You agree? That's first trip. Next trip, their distance is much smaller, but and I don't know what it is, so I call it uh, dk minus one, the distance that remained from the previous uh, flight, right? And uh, that distance will be covered partially by the fly and partially by the cyclist. The distances add up to the full distance of the previous uh, previously remaining trip. So what we have is dk equals to dk minus one minus two vtk. That's another formula that I get. I will not torture you too long. I mean, I'm not sure if you understand already. Uh, so basically, once you uh, simplify it, you get uh, this formula for time. Tk equal to dk minus one over f plus v, which ends up being uh, uh, f minus v over f plus v to the power of k minus one times distance d zero. And then uh, you can create an infinite series. Look at it, you see infinite sum. And once you solve it, you get 15, which is exactly the solution that you will suggest it. Good. I will see if you're interested in office hours, I can discuss it uh, a bit deeper if you want to hear the solution. But the point is there is an infinity that you managed to not see because you came up with a simpler way of solving this problem. But the fly travels infinitely many times back and forth. Good, and that's your clever solution that I, that I describe here. And that only is just that, uh, that the fly is in the air for the duration that the cyclists are traveling, right? So the fly um, is in, in, in the air for the time t it, it takes the cyclist to meet. And that is two times v. They are meeting, they're traveling relative to each other at double the speed, right? The distance is merged at double the speed. So two times v. It's twice the velocity of one cyclist times the time, uh, it equals to the distance. So the time the flies in the air is distance divided by two times the velocity, which in our case, uh, then the, the distance of the fly is uh, F, the speed of the fly times the time the flies in the air. Uh, and that would be simply, this is the time multiplied uh, by, by, the, uh, by, <coughs> It's the time multiplied by the speed here. So FD over 2V and you get uh, this uh, 15. Here is uh, another example, guys. And this I tell uh, pretty much very often when I remember back in 2018, I see my brother is looking at those pictures and I thought I actually made him interested in uh, in mathematics right in uh, infinity he actually recorded some of my videos when i was in class and i thought uh, finally he is interested in it he said uh, i would need your help for infinity tomorrow okay and uh, what happened with that infinity is that in the morning i wake up and he drives me somewhere very very far out state upstate and there upstate he he, he, he parks near infinity QI 30 and that's a car that he bought and he wanted me to drive the other car back. That's pretty much what he was interested in. 
Yes. And then another thing you bought for this car, you brought for this car a fractal antenna. Okay, what is a fractal antenna? Let me show you what at least, uh, well, there is, a, there is a system like that in your cell phone or an analogous uh, system uh, to that in your cell phone. Here, look, you see this picture, guys? You see this? This is a, a receiver uh, of a cell phone that, um, well, is supposed to be a good, uh, good for capturing uh, various signals, okay? Now I'm gonna show you how to manufacture this device, okay? And, and how you can make a lot of money doing so. Are you ready? Do you understand uh, what, what this device looks like? Look at it, you see this? Looks like a lot of uh, squares here. Okay, ready? So here is how this device is going to be manufactured. That's what it looks like. You've seen in the picture, yes? Here is uh, the picture here, can you see it guys? And here is that uh, device. Okay, here, let's manufacture it. So what you do is you take a square sheet of metal, which we can uh, say is of sides one by one, yes? And we subdivide each of the sides into three, creating nine segments. Do you see the nine segments? And then uh, with a machine, I punch out the middle segment. I punch out the middle segment. So now uh, this um, device has only eight pieces of metal. Do you see that? It's, it's divided into eight squares. Now look what I do next, guys. Each of the remaining squares, I subdivide into nine subsquares and I puncture out the middle. Yes? I puncture out the middle. Now each of the, now you see it also, I didn't draw the lines because it gets very messy, but each of those, I can subdivide and uh, puncture the middle. Do you understand how you manufacture it now? You subdivide basically a square into nine subsquares, puncture out the middle. So now we have uh, eight squares. For each of those, I subdivide into nine subsquares, puncture out the middle. Good. Each of the remaining ones, now, now we have uh, many of them in here. How many squares uh, around here? Help me. How many squares around here? The antenna is very good at receiving various frequencies. The, the, the purpose of the antenna is to be a good receiver, to, to be able to capture signals. So how many squares are there around this punctured square? Could, you, could anybody tell me? Eight. Exactly, eight. Eight, okay. So uh, the physics of the antenna, it's beyond our class. We're not gonna discuss that, but let's discuss uh, manufacturing. How much material do you need to build this antenna? That's my question, right? So you have one metal sheet, right? How much material are you recycling? Because you know, you puncture out those metal squares and you can uh, uh, melt them and make another, you know, you can recycle it. You can melt this metal and uh, use it for the next antenna. You agree? So my question is, um, how much are you, uh, are you recycling? How much are you using to build this antenna? We can try to see that I'll help you a little bit. You see, how much do I recycle here? I recycle one over nine, you agree? One over nine of, the, of this metal square uh, sheet, I, I recycle here. How, mu how much do I recycle here? So it's one over nine plus, what's the uh, size of this square? No, Christina, because the other squares are smaller. So how much do I recycle, right? So here is uh, recycled here is, maybe you mean how much remains, but the recycled amount, the amount that I can reuse to build the next antenna is what? You see this? Uh, it's one over nine. How much do I uh, get here? So that's one over nine recycled. How much do I get here from all of them? Do 
but they're not of the same size, uh, Jaheen. I punch out eight, but they're not of the same size. They are one ninth of the smaller squared. So yes, uh, draw, it's eight over 81 or eight over nine squared because they are one ninth of one ninth of a square. Do you agree? You see how I figure it, guys, look at it. This square is one ninth of the original one, right? So when I puncture this one out, it's one ninth of a one ninth, which means one over nine squares or one over 81. And I have eight of them. Do you agree? Uh, what do you think? How many more do I add when I puncture uh, those tiny ones out? How many do I get? That's what that's the area of one of them. And how many do I have of those tiny microscopic uh, squares? Precisely, Angelo, 64. Right, because we have eight, and then each of those will contribute eight, and each of those will contribute eight. So it's uh, eight squared divided by nine cubed. Are you seeing the pattern? Now it continues forever like this. You understand? I mean, uh, then you have uh, one ninth of and one ninth of one ninth, and you puncture another, uh, another one in the middle. Good. So my question is, uh, how much total material do you recycle in building this antenna? You're clear with my question, guys? Infinite material, but I mean, we have only this metal, this piece of metal. How much do we recycle? Again, right, we noticed that after first step, we recycled one ninth. After second step, we recycled eight over nine squared. After the next step, how much did we recycle? After the next step, how much did we recycle, guys? No, not eight over 81. I mean, that, that's eight over nine squared, that's right. So eight squared. So that next would be, you want to write it not just as a number, but to see the pattern, eight squared over nine cubed. Do you agree? Do you see why? Yes, and Justin, uh, you're writing uh, some other number afterwards. We don't need the numbers. We need the pattern because we want to see how much is recycled at the end of this procedure. Do you see what, what happens here, guys? And you see, I, I hope you are seeing how I, uh, uh, how I come to it. Look at it. One over nine is punctured here. Now I have eight pieces, right? And then uh, what do I have? I have eight times uh, uh, times this piece removed. This piece is one ninth of a one ninth. Yes? And then the piece that would be removed here is one ninth of a one ninth of a one ninth. You agree? This is, uh, uh, this is one ninth of a one ninth. And when you puncture the middle piece, I puncture uh, one ninth out of it. So it's one over nine cubed. And then how many do we have? Each new stage from each square, I, I have extra eight, uh, eight uh, pieces. Yes, extra eight pieces. So uh, what's the pattern? Do you see the pattern? Because guys, I mean, uh, so when you say so what's, what's the next, uh, what's the next uh, um, stage? How much do we remove next? Eight to the third over nine to the fourth. Exactly, right? Yeah. And now I want you to tell me how much did I remove? How much material did I remove? Exactly, Justin. It's a very important topic. If you, of course, do anything with mathematics in your life, that's going to be uh, all the time with you. So you want to learn it as fast as possible. 
And it's a very, very diverse and uh, interesting subject. It's called infinite series. And so how much do I get? So it's going to be um, 1 over 9 plus 8 over 9 S in this case. Yes. So uh, first, Jahin, there, is all, there are my lecture notes. That's A. And obviously, there is a section in your textbook about it. You can just look at infinite series in the textbook. So you set it S, right? We just, well, that's what we were doing all the time, guys, right? So, I mean, you need to just realize that uh, you should not have your mind in cubicles, right? Your mind is not in cubicles. You see, I, I want to say this. Is there are so many nice words for in cubicles. My favorite in German is abgeriegelt. It's like you are completely surrounded, uh, entombed in, 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 in cubicles. So what do we do here? So that's my S. You see why I place parentheses over here is because what's in the, my red parentheses looks like the original sum. You agree? Now, what do I factor out? What am I factoring out? Eight over nine, precisely. I want to factor eight over nine because then it will start with one over nine, yes? You understand guys what was it's it's not a prescription it's just you realize what made this solution work by the way anna uh, anna glazer i think i might have something important to tell you if you stay afterwards right because uh, it's just something that might be administrative and causing you problems okay uh, yeah okay so the answer is one over nine plus eight over nine and then what remains in the parentheses is s that's why i factored eight over nine do you agree are you with me guys you see what i did if i factor out eight over nine this is one over nine this is eight over nine squared and onwards now when i move it across look what happens s minus minus eight over nine s is what this will be uh, one over nine S equal to one over nine. So yes, so S, this, the amount I removed is equal to one. Would anyone care to interpret what has happened here? What am I just uh, saying? So S equals to one, what does it mean? Exactly, Robert. The fact that S is equal to one is just another way of saying that you don't need any material to build this antenna. So what you do to start your business, you take this one metal sheet, you puncture the metals, melt it together, manufacture the next antenna, melt it together, manufacture the next antenna. So you just need the one sheet of metal, you know, a very small one by one sheet of metal, and you can manufacture infinity many such antennas. You never run out of material. You see, and I can show you how much they cost online. Do you want to see? You can check that those antennas, I mean, easily uh, $30 per piece. Right, here you go, you're welcome. Good. Here is uh, uh, the antenna my brother bought is this type of thing. He brought this crop. He, he, the same thing made of triangles. Let's say he bought it for his infinity uh, IQ 30. No, I did not. Uh, my brother just uh, put it on the car. I bought the car and then he decided it's fitting to have this antenna on top of it. Good, but such things again, uh, one of those patterns is frequently found in your uh, in your cell phone. Good. Let's go on. All 
All right. I should at this point, I suppose, quickly show you, I mean, I have right now 30 people, actually probably 29. Uh, and that means that I am missing four or five people from this class. You know what happens to people that don't study, uh, don't actually do the, their use. Let me show you quickly. Yeah. Watch carefully. Gave you a warning. Stay for office hours or stay there forever. So back to uh, the material at hand. Remember how we started considering limits, guys? We're going back to limits. We considered limits as x goes to a of f of x. And what we did with those limits, what is limit as x goes to a? What am I plugging in into my function? What am I, what I mean limit as x goes to a is a limit of the function. What am I plugging in? Something very close to a current, thank you. Again, guys, uh, one other thing we will begin doing in office hours today is I don't see that you're opening up any solutions, any exercises, and we need to start solving a lot of those, okay? So what happens then uh, if instead of A, I want to push the limit as X goes to infinity? What do you imagine I plug into my function? When I say limit as X goes to infinity, I'm plugging into my function what? A very large number, Jahin. Exactly, uh, exactly. A very large number is going to be inserted into my function. So now let's uh, see what is this limit, guys. Limit as x goes to infinity of x squared minus one divided by x squared plus one. So Christiana, very good. And how do you solve it? What strategy do you employ? We will learn how to solve those things very fast, but uh, before so, we need to understand how we come to the solution. Okay. Let's do it uh, um, like this. So, so beginner students usually do the following. 
Usually they say, okay, this is infinity squared minus one, which is infinity. And the bottom is infinity squared plus one, which is infinity. This is a number divided by itself, which is equal to one, okay? But you have to remember that this symbol is very crude. It just means that numerator is growing without bound. It doesn't talk about how fast or how slow. And this is doing the same for the denominator. I do not know based, based on that symbol if it's very fast or very slow. The answer happens to be one, but coincidentally. Okay, so here is how you might try to uh, reason it out. Look at it. X squared minus one, I can factor out an X squared. Do you agree? Look at it. You think you cannot factor an X squared because you don't see it, but you can very much so. X is a positive number. You factor out X squared and you write one minus one over X squared. Do you see that if I multiply it through, I get the original expression, yes? So I factored out X squared and I do the same for the denominator. Do you see that? Now, once they are factored out, I can cross them out. They are just, a, it's a finite number divided by itself and the number is obviously large, so it's not zero. So I cross it out and I'm left with the limit as X goes to infinity of one minus one over X squared and one plus one over X squared. Now I know very well what happens here. One divided by a huge number is essentially zero. And that same thing is over here. You see, so it's one minus a zero plus divided by one plus a zero plus. So the ratio is very close to one over one. And the answer is indeed one, okay? And we make the following definition, guys. We say that as X goes to infinity, the limit, if the limit is equal to L, we call it a horizontal asymptote. The line Y equals L will be called a horizontal asymptote if that happens. Now, what is an asymptote? Let me try to explain to you. So it's just a, a word that you use to, uh, to relate to an, a very, very simple familiar object. So when you look into the clouds, right? You look into the clouds and um, you see maybe a unicorn. Right, then you're saying that this complex shape of the cloud looks to you like the more familiar shape of a unicorn. Okay, or when I, in the analogies I wrote over here, you'd say to a girl, your eyes shine like two moons. Right, so then what you're saying is that the eyes that are much less familiar to maybe her or other people remind you of a moon. Okay, or that the cloud reminds you of a fluffy sheep. And an asymptote is precisely that. It's just an analogy to something that you are more familiar with, right? So uh, a line Y equals L, Y equals L is just a horizontal line. And a horizontal line is one of the simplest objects you can think of, right? So what you're saying is that if you scroll to the right on the graph of this uh, function, X squared minus one over X squared plus one, it will look to you like eventually like it's just a flat line, horizontal line. Do you see that? Think about it, guys. What does it mean that if X, if, what this is saying is that if X is very large, the ratio is essentially one. You agree? When you say limit is one, you're saying, give me a very large number. For all large numbers, you're seeing ratio that's very similar to one. Do you agree? So what sort of graph do you have? So uh, pick X equal to a million and X equal to a million and one and million and two and anything in between, those are large numbers. The altitude is essentially one, right? So the drawing you're obtaining is the graph of a horizontal line, Y equals L, Y equals one in that case. Do you follow that? If you don't remember graphs, guys, if you cannot visualize those things, you don't, uh, you should not be tempted to leave the class and uh, stay as much as possible to discuss ideas that you don't comprehend. You are all supposed to go through Appendix A through Appendix E, and I have a feeling that uh, I would be surprised if one person opened it, honestly. So here is the next question, guys. Find the horizontal asymptotes for f of x equal to two x cubed plus x minus one over x cubed plus x squared plus five. Go ahead, see if you can do it.
Okay, uh, two people are answered, have answered that they are correct. Okay, more people follow. Let's see how that works out. Look at it, guys. So what we do is, what I suggest doing, is to factor the highest power in numerator and the same thing to do for the denominator, highest power. So I factor out x cubed. You see that? x cubed times two plus, you see here we have x divided by x cubed because I don't have a, an x cubed and here I have one divided by x cubed, right? Look at it, when I multiply it through, the x cubes will cancel. You see that? I do the same for the denominator. I factor out an x cubed. And then here I simplify, simplify the x cubes. And I'm left with two plus one over x squared minus one over x cubed. And here I left with one plus one over x plus five over x cubed. Each of those disappear to zero. As x becomes very large, this is essentially zero. This is essentially zero. And what we are getting is two. Do we have a horizontal asymptote? And also, what does it mean that, uh, when I ask this question? Okay, Jahin, very good. Would anybody care to explain to me what a horizontal asymptote means before we finish today's lecture? Okay. Okay, guys, you see, you say the graph never touches. That's not what it means at all. Here is uh, uh, what, uh, what it means. Look at it, guys. You see this? I get the number two, which means, what, what am I really observing? It's, I'm saying that if you plug, instead of x very large numbers, look at it. Here is my function. Here is my function. This is my function f, right? So the graph of this function is x, f of x. You agree? The graph of this function is x, f of x. If the coordinate x is very large, very large, then that graph will essentially be x comma two, because uh, the function will essentially look like the number two, very, very little difference from two. It has nothing to do with intersections. The graph of x equal x comma two is what? What's the graph here? Look at it. This is, this is a complicated graph. You cannot right away figure out what it is, but x comma two is a very, very simple graph. Do you agree? This is the graph y equals two. It means no matter what's the x, the altitude is always two. So we are walking on a plane. You understand? So that means that if I look at this graph of this function, it might be very complicated. Let me maybe even show you uh, uh, what it might be. Let me actually, maybe not for this one, I don't really want to write those equations. Let me write uh, this one, x squared minus one, x squared plus one. Let's see uh, what we will get. Here is that graph, you see here, it doesn't look at all like a line, right? Uh, but um, let's say from x equal to 100. What would that be now? Let's see. Can I do it? Well, I haven't troubleshooted it, so let's see if we can move it uh, to, to the right. Can we move it? Here, yes, good. Look what happens. You see? Look what happens, guys. Are you seeing what's happening? Yes? What's happening here? In this case, it looks like the number one more and more. Do you look at, look how flat it becomes as I scroll and oh, 10, 11, you see what's happening? That's what makes it uh, a horizontal asymptote. Look at it, you look at this graph, would you have imagined this is not a straight line? No, right? 
So it has nothing to do with intersections or anything else. It just tries to tell you what the graph begins to look like if X is a large value. Are you following me? You understand what the word asymptotes means? It replaced the word asymptote and thing looks like, very similar to, okay? Asymptote is what you compare to. You have a more complex graph and you compare it to something much simpler that is much more familiar, good? So in the other e equation, if I were to write it out, it would be approaching the line Y equals to two, clear? All right, guys, so I will release you uh, for today unless you stay with me for office hours and let me know if you would like to play a what, when, where question. So if not, we'll go straight to uh, solving problems. Uh, Jaheen, go ahead, ask me your question. Okay, um, sorry, I have three questions. The first one is that I, um, I try to look in the textbook and the closest thing to, I think, a series I found was chapter 11. That's correct. Now, now, what we covered, I believe, was geometric series and yes. in the terms of infinite sum. Yes. And um, the question is now, since we're looking at in, um, limits, limits at infinity, mm -hmm. how do we relate what we just learned about the, you know, um, the infinite sum equation to this limit infinity? Like, how do we evaluate it? How are, how, what is the problem solving strategy that puts it well, all together? We, we, we solve the solving problems, solving strategies. We, we saw the, um, uh, that um, uh, antenna, Sierpitsky curve that we were puncturing squares out. We've seen uh, the fly flying back and forth. We've seen uh, the probability. This is just illustrations of those ideas. We don't need to solve them rigorously right now. The point is that they all have to do with, with the idea of infinity. We don't need to, you don't have to look into the book to understand uh, what I mean. If you can solve, if you understand that, let's say 0 0.3333 is one is three over 10 plus three over 10 squared plus three over 10 cubed and onwards, you understand, uh, um, you understand as much as I covered. You see, you understand what is in okay. my notes. You understand all that you have to understand for this class at the moment. Okay. And, um, Okay, so, so as long as I follow was, your... What was not, um, uh, you understood what happened today, yes? Yes, yes. It was just Great. hard to... You are, like, you, are, you are on top of everything. It's high. No, 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 I'm not because it's higher. Like, this is the first time I'm seeing series and sums. I have to go over your lectures, like, twice to understand, like, because it's not calculus. And it's so far, it's just algebra 2, you know, background and everything that I'm coming from. So it's hard. And as for your Thursday office hours, it's for the evening class. Is it okay if I come in during that time to you ask can you come, questions okay, about Okay, guys, uh, you can join any class or any office hours, you understand? Uh, any class or any office hours, you're invited to just, you know, the same uh, code should work. You just join and you are in. If you are tired in the morning, you want to go to the office hours in the evening, you do that. Thank you, Professor. Good. And so in, in the lectures, we will get to the calculus and you will see why I talk about infinite series. I want to give you a sort of uh, point of view. I want to teach those ideas even before you uh, go to those. Uh, uh, they are related. It's really similar to limit to infinity. They are very related and can be understood right now, at least in what I wrote in my notes. Good. You can join other timings, guys. If you, you, have you seen my, uh, my uh, syllabi, right? You've seen everything about me if you have. Here is uh, the syllabus, okay? So you go to this folder. And uh, here is this folder here. And you can see that you have spring 2000, uh, uh, 2021. You see the three classes I'm teaching this semester. You're welcome. You can come and, uh, uh, and look at uh, any of the office hours or any of the classes I teach if you so desire. Good. All right, so uh, what do we want to do right now? I see 10 people left. You ready guys? What would you like uh, to do? Would you like a what went work question or you're not in the mood for one and want to do right away um, questions for, for this class? Let me know. And besides, uh, let, me, uh, let me say something. Uh, Anna, are you still here? Yes, I'm still here. So uh, one small thing is it, it might have happened that the system uh, dropped you uh, or you're, that you're not registered uh, for this class, right? 
it could be so it could not be so just check it so that uh, so that if, if in the if it, if it's so we will try to re-register you if that's possible right because who knows what happens with it okay just wanted to uh, warn you if i'm not mistaken i've seen something like that right but uh, obviously i want you to stay regardless of anything and you can of course visit any lecture i checked on my community first and then you brought it up i'm still registered for the tuesday thursday section okay because, because it said that somebody dropped you understand and i think it used your your name but uh just just to be make sure that uh, that basically because I see the system, the only way I post grades is when I, uh, I, I, I just fill in the boxes, you say, so I need to have your name in the box. But for this section specifically, because um, I was registered for your evening class at first, and then I switched it in a job. Ah, so you're in the, you, you, you switched it and you went to the morning section. To right? this one, yeah. Okay, makes sense then. Okay, so I suppose I've seen your name in the evening section. Just wanted to be sure. Great. Thank you. Sure. Important. Uh, well, I, I, what important? You have to you have to begin studying, guys. Right? Uh, you, you have to. So first of all, let's uh, see what we can uh, we can begin solving. Okay. Let's begin uh, practicing some questions. Uh, anybody wants here some uh, what, when, where, or not? So I presume not. Nobody said anything, right? Uh, so two people want what, when, where, or um, is that? A, Yes, please. Okay, what, when, where question. One what, when, where question as customer, and then we do the, uh, the other thing. One second, give me one moment. Apologies, guys. <laughs> <laughs> 